Over the past 30 years, Australia, along with just about every other Western society, has been transformed by a revolution engineered from the top down by the leading echelons of the corporate welfare state. New class cadres of managers, professionals, politicians, and academics have dismantled the foundations of Australian nationhood laid down at the time of federation. The arbitration system, the protective tariff, and the white Australia policy, all have gone in order to facilitate the free flow of capital, technology, and labour in a globalist economy. The most revolutionary, by far, of these radical changes has been the decision to open Australia to mass third world immigration. In taking this step, the managerial regime has, in effect, followed the riot advice tendered by Bertolt Brecht to the East German government on the occasion of the Workers' Revolt in 1956. Rather than relying on crude repressive measures, Brecht suggested, the communist regime should simply dissolve the people and elect a new one. Indeed, since the end of the Second World War a strange alliance of communists, Christian churches, ethnic lobbies, and other pressure groups working through the corporate sector and within the centralised apparatus of state power set out deliberately to flood the Anglo-Australian homeland with a polyglot mass of third world immigrants. Chief among the ideological weapons deployed in that campaign have been the interwoven myths of equality and universal human rights. The official ideology of the globalist regime has been enshrined in the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. According to that document, any doctrine of superiority based on racial differentiation is scientifically false, morally condemnable, socially unjust and dangerous. There can therefore be no justification for racial discrimination, in theory or in practice, anywhere. Those who subscribed to the doctrine of racial egalitarianism were bound to oppose a colour bar on immigration to Australia as being both immoral and pointless. It was axiomatic that racial differences are not significant differences that need divide mankind. Racial egalitarianism rather obviously flies in the face of the more realistic premises of the white Australia policy. The founding fathers of the Australian nation regarded racial differences as a fact of life and racial conflict as the inevitable consequence of a multiracial society. In their view, ethnic homogeneity was one of the great strengths of the Australian nation, one that ought to be preserved and not squandered or thrown away in pursuit of utopian visions of universal harmony in which lions could be re-educated to lie down with lambs. Forty years after Australian governments began to distance themselves from the white Australia policy, advances in genetics, paleoanthropology, psychology, and medical science are placing the universalist doctrines of racial egalitarianism under serious pressure. A vast range of studies in a number of disciplines have revealed real and important differences between the races in cognitive and athletic ability, behavior and temperament. Faced with such intellectual challenges, defenders of the ruling orthodoxy are resorting to social ostracism, legal repression, and even the sort of physical coercion deployed against members of the One Nation Party some years back. The time is clearly ripe for a courageous and well-informed reappraisal of the white Australia policy and the decision to dismantle it. Unfortunately, racial realists, concerned to bring common sense to contemporary Australian debates over race and immigration, will be disappointed with two recent books on the white Australia policy. Both promise much but deliver little because of their author's determined refusal to take race seriously. Was the White Australia policy racist? The first of these books to appear was written by Keith Winschuttle, a former Marxist academic turned independent neoconservative writer. Hot on the heels of his controversial revision of the Black Armband view of Aboriginal history, Winschuttle has upset yet another academic apple cart. In the White Australia policy, he sets out to refute the orthodox leftist charge that the immigration legislation enacted shortly after Federation was racist. On the formal level that is easily done, since the Immigration Restriction Act, 1901 did not explicitly prohibit non-white immigration. Instead, prospective immigrants were required to pass a dictation test by writing out 50 words in any European language selected by immigration officials. But because both the intent and the practical effect of the dictation test were to sharply limit coloured immigration, Australia was open to attack from progressives around the world and, especially during the Cold War, from newly assertive post-colonial regimes in Asia and Africa. Over the last 40 years, a homegrown generation of new left historians routinely portrayed Australia as a racist pariah nation on a par with South Africa. Ever since the 60s generation began its long march through the institutions, Australians have been taught to approach their past in a self-hating mood of enthusiastic shame. To his credit, Winschuttle has been one of the few historians to resist this form of intellectual self-flagellation. Unfortunately, Winschuttle's rehabilitation of the white Australia policy is premised on a familiar, if pernicious, tenet of neoconservatism. Like those who claim that the United States is a creedal nation, Winschuttle maintains that the operating premise of Australian society is the proposition that all people are equal in principle and in potential. Supposedly, Australia's national identity is based on a civic patriotism, thereby fostering loyalty to Australia's liberal democratic political institutions rather than to race or ethnicity.
He contends that the White Australia policy, far from being the reactionary spawn of an irredeemably racist nation, grew out of a long-established, progressive program aiming to extend both the freedom and the dignity of labour. Earlier movements to end slavery throughout the British Empire and the transportation of convicts to Australia culminated in a concerted campaign to prevent the importation of cheap coolie labour from Asia and the Pacific Islands. Windschuttle claims, therefore, that opposition to Asian immigration was not grounded in fears of racial contamination. Rather, politicians were concerned both to protect the standard of living of Australian workers and to prevent the emergence of a racially based political underclass that would undermine Australia's egalitarian democracy. This argument rests upon a false dichotomy. Australia's egalitarian democracy was conceived as a new and better Britannia. Who could have doubted that Antipodean Britons, too, were white Europeans? By the turn of the 20th century, references to the crimson thread of kinship binding Australians to the mother country had become a staple of political rhetoric. Most Australians hardly needed to be reminded that blood is thicker than water. Nevertheless, Windschuttle portrays their leaders as proto Boasian anthropologists rejecting any suggestion that racial differences marked a permanent or intractable barrier between different branches of the human brotherhood. Windschuttle maintains that most early 20th century Australians were confident that Chinese and Indian labourers would become indistinguishable from white Australians of British stock once they were detached from the environments fostering their historic cultures of servility. Windschuttle concedes that the immigration restriction movement did attract support from unequivocally racist elements. Indeed, he savors the irony in the fact that in early 20th century Australia, the most sympathetic audience for racial nationalism was found among the bohemian writers, artists, and intellectuals of the leftist intelligentsia. That elite minority, then famously associated with the Bulletin magazine, bears an uncanny resemblance to the chattering classes now, they agree on almost everything, with the conspicuous exception of immigration policy, where their positions are reversed. Revolution from above? By contrast, Windschuttle insists, mainstream Australians have never subscribed to biological theories of race. Influenced instead by the universalistic principles of both evangelical Christianity and the Scottish Enlightenment, they have refused to treat white Europeans as superior and other races as innately and permanently inferior. This, then, is the crux of Windschuttle's argument, because the white Australia policy was never based on racial nationalism, it could be, and was, readily jettisoned once the original political, economic, and cultural justifications for its adoption lost their potency. The proof that Australia wore the policy lightly was the ease with which it discarded it. In other words, if the white Australia policy really had been steeped in racist paranoia, it would be difficult to explain the fact that dismantling it in the 20 years from the mid-1950s onward required no major cultural upheaval and was accomplished with a minimum of fuss by liberal politicians with values similar to those held by the original skeptics and critics when immigration restrictions were introduced in 1901. Windschuttle is mainly concerned with the rise of the immigration restriction movement. His argument with the academic establishment is pitched as a simple matter of historical fact, was the White Australia policy racist or not? Another recent book, The Long, Slow Death of White Australia, by Gwenda Taven, deals with its demise. In her first chapter, Taven differs from Wynne's shuttle on the reasons for the ascendancy of White Australia, insisting that racism and xenophobia were driving forces in the campaign to restrict non-white immigration. But, like Wynne's shuttle, she is struck by the ease with which opponents of the White Australia policy were able to overturn it. Her brief is to rebut the most obvious explanation for the lack of massive popular resistance to such a fundamental change, namely, that the White Australia policy was dismantled by an elite conspiracy operating in stealth, leaving the Australian people in the dark concerning the nature and magnitude of the mass third world immigration soon to be inflicted upon them. Taven is not especially convincing in her effort to demonstrate that the Australian public readily accepted higher non-European immigration as early as the 1970s. Her main evidence is the fact that the Whitlam government was re-elected in 1974, even after its Minister for Immigration, Al Graspe, publicly proclaimed his determination to bury the White Australia policy. Of course Whitlam's Labour government was soundly rejected by the electorate in 1975. The incoming Fraser government certainly had no mandate to promote a massive influx of non-white immigrants. Nevertheless, it joined with the Australian Labour Party to forge a bipartisan consensus in favour of third world immigration. For decades, there was no effective political opposition to the revolution from above in immigration law and policy. Among the managerial and professional classes, a complacently, cosmopolitan, consensus reigned supreme. The political equilibrium was not upset until the meteoric rise of the One Nation Party in the late 1990s. Then, for a brief, shining moment, the patriotic instincts of the more, parochial, outer suburban, white Australians found a political voice. Much to the relief of the political class, however, that too often tongue-tied voice of populist protest was largely ineffectual and, in any case, was soon silenced. <laughs> 
Concerned to counter suggestions that the new regime lacked popular support from the beginning, Taven cites opinion polls from the mid-1970s favoring the then-current rate of Asian migration. When weighing such evidence, one wonders how citizens then would have responded to pollsters had they been presented with an accurate picture of how Sydney and Melbourne, in particular, would look after 30 years of colonisation by third world immigrants. Taven acknowledges that debate still continues over how many non-whites should be allowed to enter while insisting that a majority of Australians since the 1960s have unequivocally rejected any policy that would completely bar non-Europeans from settling. White Australia, she maintains, is no longer a dominant worldview, at most, it persists as a residual cultural form. Even so, she concedes that the battle against white Australia is not completely won. From Pauline Hanson to the Tampa incident, recent events have revealed that the white, Anglo-Celtic racial cultural ideals of Australian nationhood have never been completely extinguished. Taven fears that, like the slow, silent combustion of an underground coal seam, the fiery force of white racial consciousness may burst, without warning, through the surface somnolence secured, so far, by the multiracialist mullahs of the media, the human rights industry, and the educational establishment. Taven clearly shares Winschuttle's conventionally progressive views on the nature and significance of race. As committed racial egalitarians, both writers desperately want to drive a stake through the heart of racial realism, once and for all. Taven and Wins Chuttle still worry that, despite having been in a state of suspended animation for several decades, residual forms of racial identity might someday reawaken in the hearts of white Australians, perhaps even with renewed vigour and enhanced vitality. For that reason, Wins Chuttle happily joins the left in its attack upon races an unscientific category, as a thoroughly modern, bad idea engendered by the new social sciences and brought to maturity by the evolutionary biology of the 19th century. In the battle between racial realism and racial egalitarianism, former Professor Winschuttle joins his old revolutionary comrades on the barricades, resolutely denying that differences between races have a biological or genetic foundation. In his thoroughly orthodox opinion, 19th century anthropology and biology took a wrong turn when they denied enlightenment and evangelical ideas about the unity of humanity. For him, the evident differences between the various races of mankind are the malleable product of their cultures and the particular stage each may have reached in the long ascent from savagery to civilization. No race is permanently incapable of change and development. Somewhat imprudently, Winschuttle suggests that to take any other view on this question is to betray one's ignorance of the subject. In fact, to anyone familiar with the rapidly expanding literature on the genetic character of racial differences, Winschuttle's Dogmatism is a clear case of what American commentator Steve Saylor calls racial flat earthism. Biology and culture There is still room for debate on the precise genetic contribution to any given racial difference in, for example, intelligence, temperament, criminality, and athletic ability. But that such racial differences do exist and that they have a biological basis is not any longer open to serious scientific question. As Vincent Sarich and Frank Meal put it, the case for race hinges on recognition that genetic variation in traits that affect performance and ultimately survival is the fuel on which the evolutionary process runs. Without that functional genetic variation, there can be no adaptive evolution. Variation is the norm, dot and not, dot the exception in the case of humans. In fact, Sarich and Meal suggest that the range of genetic variation between different races of Homo sapiens is much greater than for any other species, including domesticated dogs. They observe that commonly used genetic tests can determine with great precision not just an individual's race but also the percentage of racial background in people of mixed ancestry. But until very recently it was impossible to detect the genetic markers distinguishing a cocker spaniel from a wolf. Race exists and it matters across a wide range of public policy issues. It is of particular relevance to any analysis of immigration law and policy. Winschuttle, however, is determined to remain uncontaminated by the new sciences of racial difference. He does recognise the seemingly insuperable cultural barriers alienating mainstream Australians from other racial groups, particularly the Chinese. Nevertheless he asserts that it is a fundamental error to slide from the concept of culture to that of race. Since cultural differences are not inbred and immutable, there is no insuperable barrier to the assimilation of large numbers of non-white migrants into Australian society. But what if Winschuttle is wrong? What if racial differences are, in large part, biologically or genetically grounded? What if even culture is not simply a social construct but, rather, a phenomenon with a substantial biological component? Winschuttle does document the dominance of Enlightenment and Christian influences in Middle Australia, demonstrating that explicitly racialist ideologies have had little appeal to opinion leaders in Australia. But that may mean only that Australians, like other ethnic groups tracing their ancestry to northwestern Europe, are predisposed to individualism, exogamy, and small nuclear families and, as a consequence, display a relative lack of ethnocentrism.
Thus what Winschuttle describes as a creedal commitment to racial egalitarianism may actually be a defining characteristic of a distinctive European racial identity not shared by other peoples. Kevin MacDonald explains Western cultural traits as an evolutionary adaptation to the rigors of life in cold, ecologically adverse climates. Natural selection worked there to favor the reproductive success of those individuals capable of sustaining non-kinship-based forms of reciprocity. Over time, individualistic social structures encouraged the emergence in England of the common law of property and contract and, later still, the emergence of impersonal corporate forms of business enterprise, all requiring cooperation between strangers. The distinctive culture that emerged from the interaction between the genotype of the English people and their environment can be understood as what Richard Dawkins calls an extended phenotype. Like the spider's web or the beaver's dam, the extended phenotypes of Western civilization are part of a biocultural feedback loop linking our genes with our environment over countless generations. The extended phenotype produced by the English people finds its greatest political expression in the phenomenon of nationhood. Appearing first of all in England, the idea of the nation could be understood as what Richard Dawkins might call a meme that has been only imperfectly or not at all replicated in the bioculture of other, particularly non-European, races. Some scholars, however, deny that English nationhood is the product of a primordial English ethnicity. It is often remarked that there are very few nations that seem to be ethnically homogeneous and that England is not one of them. On this view, the English nation emerged out of populations deposited by successive waves of alien conquest. It was through the merging or assimilation of peoples who were originally distinct that a single English nation arose. According to Margaret Canovan, English nationhood was in no sense a reflection of primordial ties of blood. On the contrary, the English nation was remarkably inclusive, taking in not only the signs of Danish, Norman, Saxon, and some Welsh stock, but also, and, at the time, more significantly, nobles and commoners. Canovan's case would appear to be clinched by the subsequent expansion of English into British identity, carrying the nation even farther away from anything resembling primordial ethnicity. Constitutional patriotism it seems, then, that civic rather than ethnic nationalism has been the defining feature of not just Australian and American but British identity as well. Roger Scruton lends support to that suggestion when he remarks that modern citizenship presupposes a society of strangers, the good citizen recognizes obligations towards people who are not, and cannot be, known to him. Such a society of strangers cannot survive without the kind of courage, discipline and self-sacrifice that stem from civic patriotism. But neither Canovan nor Scruton embraces the bloodless vision of constitutional patriotism promoted by Keith Winschuttle and the American neoconservatives. For her part, Canovan acknowledges that nations are political communities that are experienced as if they were communities of kin. She adds, however, that the as if is vital. In doing so, she seeks to mark out a middle position between ethnic and civic nationalism. Neither Canovan nor Scruton believes that a nation can be grounded in an abstract loyalty to a particular political regime or constitutional order. Under the label of constitutional patriotism, Winschuttle is marketing a thoroughly artificial nationhood. Inhabiting an ancestral homeland, a real nation binds its citizens together in an inherited community of memory, language, culture, and, indeed, of blood. Citizens are members of a pre-political community that includes the living, their ancestors, and their unborn offspring. Absent generations are among the strangers to whom the good citizen is bound in a common web of rights and duties. Canovan, too, affirms both that, within any particular nation, many fellow nationals really will be blood relations, and that nations depend upon the symbolism of kinship for much of their emotional appeal. But she rejects the claims of ethnic nationalism, pointing out that much of that kinship is imagined kinship, and a good deal of it is always fictitious. The problem with Canovan's argument is that she does not give sufficient weight to the peculiarities of the English. As a consequence, like Winschuttle, in relation to the white Australia policy, she sets up a false dichotomy between ethnic and civic nationalism. In the case of England and the old white dominions settled by people of British stock, including the United States, there is simply no contradiction between the two. That is part of the reason why, for 200 years after the emergence of the English nation, it was the only nation. Even those citizens of a modern nation who are blood relations are expected to treat each other publicly as if they were strangers bound together by a willingness to recognize the fundamental constitutional norms associated with the rule of law, representative government, and individual rights. Only a people such as the English, characterized by the non-kinship-based forms of reciprocity associated with Protestant Christianity, monogamy and companionate marriage, nuclear families, a marked emphasis on extended kinship relations, and a strong tendency towards individualism, could possibly succeed in creating such a society of strangers. It is true, of course, that the English nation was the hybrid product of many pre-existing ethnic groups. But the fact is that the ingredients in the ethnic stew that ultimately produced the English people and, later still, British nation, were not all that genetically remote from one another.
Indeed, the Danes, the Saxons, and the Normans were closely related Germanic peoples and the genetic distance between the English, the Scots, and the Irish was not much more significant. Precisely because all of the Germanic peoples were relatively individualistic and comparatively less ethnocentric than Eurasian and African races, they were able to overcome their group differences when they encountered each other in England, merging into a new ethne possessed of its own distinctive language, religion, and way of life. The relative inclusiveness of English national identity was replicated in the settler dominions. In fact, the English, Irish, Scottish, Welsh, and even continental European settlers in colonial America, English Canada, Australia, and New Zealand fused together to become more British than the British in their new homelands. The creation of those colonial British cultures was an important first step on the road to creating new national identities as Americans, Australians, Canadians, and New Zealanders. Civic nationalism was, therefore, a meme replicated best and most easily through the vehicle provided by the Anglo-Saxon genotype. This exposes a fundamental paradox built into the free and open societies of the West, the only racial groups able to fit seamlessly into the society of strangers constituting a civic nation are those whose members can easily shed the deeply ingrained ethnocentrism and xenophobia characterizing most non-European peoples. Receptivity to civic nationalism, in other words, is found only in a relatively few, mainly Northwestern European, ethnic or racial groups. Unfortunately, over the past two centuries the nationhood meme has undergone a monstrous mutation. Originally, the English nation created the state as a medium for political self-expression. Since then, the transnational corporate welfare state has taken on a life of its own, asserting its power and right to recreate the nation and its people in whatever form it chooses. The result in Australia was the covert decision by political, corporate, and cultural elites to abandon the white Australia policy. The downside of diversity the conventional wisdom holds that race is merely an imaginary social construct, all significant group differences are the malleable products of culture. Therefore, it is said, social engineering by enlightened policy makers can overcome racial divisions in polyethnic societies. Now, it is true that biology is not destiny, morality and character also work to shape individual and group behavior. But they, too, are intertwined intimately with the predispositions built into racial genotypes. As a consequence, ethnic conflict is an inescapable fact of life. Unfortunately, those who abandoned the white Australia policy were driven by a dogged determination to deny the reality of racial differences in favour of a sweeping cultural revolution. According to the shorter Oxford English Dictionary, culture denotes the refinement of mind, tastes and manners. Clearly there can be no mind, tastes or manners without a brain and the body that houses it. And, if the biology of the brain and the body differs between races or sexes, for that matter, as it does, it will be reflected in their respective cultures. This would be a thoroughly uncontroversial proposition but for the ideologically driven efforts of Boasian anthropology to treat culture as a superorganic phenomenon altogether detached from human biology. As Roger Sandall remarks, the anthropological concept of culture is far too general for its own good, a fact which makes its explanatory importance hard to evaluate, because it explains everything, it also tends to explain nothing. One need not resort to a crude genetic determinism to recognize the deeply entrenched character of cultural differences between racial groups. The culture of any given racial group is never static, it changes and develops, for better or for worse. Black Africans, for example, have been present in large numbers in America for almost 400 years. During that time, their culture has been transformed in countless ways. But never have they been successfully integrated into the common culture of white Americans. It remains an open question whether other races can be absorbed into either the American or the Australian nation more easily than the now militantly hyphenated African Americans. Experience with the overseas Chinese diaspora throughout the Pacific Rim also gives cause for concern. As the numerous Chinese colonies in Australia's largest cities grow in size, wealth, and power, even their Australian-born members may be reluctant to dissolve their ancient collective identity into an individualistic society of strangers owing allegiance to nothing beyond a modern paper constitution, now divorced from its own ancestral roots. Thousands of years ago, the Chinese took an evolutionary path favoring the growth of centralized, authoritarian regimes. Not surprisingly, the Chinese today place a premium on clannish behavior and downplay the worth of individual creativity. The result has been a people marked by higher average intelligence, but more conformity, hierarchy, and racial solidarity, than Northwestern European societies. Even when faced with competition from highly cohesive ethnic groups such as the Chinese, a great many individualistic Australians remain utterly oblivious to their own genetic interest in a racially homogeneous society. The demographic threat to that interest grows as immigrants are drawn from racial groups whose genotypes are ever more distant from Australia's largely European gene pool. Like any other ethno-nation, white Australians constitute a large, partly inbred, extended family.
Since an ethnie is analogous to a population of cousins, even distant kin carry genetic interests for each other. But, because, at any given level of technology, the Australian landmass has a finite carrying capacity, mass immigration must replace future Australian children with those of other, more or less unrelated, ethnic extended families. The damage caused by third world immigration to the genetic interests of European peoples can now be quantified with considerable precision. Frank Salter has calculated that if England, for example, received 12.5 million closely related Danish immigrants, the genetic loss to the remaining English would be relatively low, amounting to the equivalent of 209,000 children still a large family to lose. But the same number of immigrants from India would cause a corresponding loss of 2.6 million children. Since black, sub-Saharan Africans are even more genetically distant from the English, an influx of 12.5 million Bantus would displace the equivalent of 13 million English children. The genetic losses to the English would be greater still if Indians or Bantus had fertility rates higher than the host population. Apart from the objective genetic interests at stake, a multiracial society forces white Australians to bear other, more subjectively painful social, economic and political costs. At the high end of Australia's immigrant intake, a growing cognitive elite of East Asians threatens to become similar to market-dominant minorities such as the overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia, Jews in Russia, or Indians in East Africa. Faced with competition from a growing East Asian population, white Australians now find themselves outgunned. Western-style old boy preference networks are only weakly ethnic in character, and, thus, permeable, making them no match for the institutionally directed, in-group solidarity or ethnic nepotism, practiced by other groups. Endowed with an edge in IQ and a temperament conducive to rigorous regimes of coaching, rote learning, and stricter parental discipline, young East Asians already dominate the competition for places in universities and professional schools. Within two to three decades, it is not unreasonable to expect that Australia will have a heavily Asian managerial professional ruling class that will not hesitate to promote the interests of co-ethnics at the expense of white Australians. There is no shortage of Chinese authority for such predictions. A recent book by the Philippine-born Chinese-American Amy Chua provides a striking discussion of the intractable conflicts between the overseas Chinese and the host populations of just about every country in Southeast Asia. In the Philippines, for example, the Chinese minority, representing only 1% of the population, controls over 60% of the economy. Such a lopsided situation generates widespread resentment among Filipinos. This simmering tension boiled over onto Chua's own family when an elderly aunt was murdered by her Filipino chauffeur, a crime all but ignored by Filipino police. Similar conflicts are an inescapable fact of life almost everywhere in Southeast Asia, most famously in Malaysia, where locals became so incensed over the dominance of the overseas Chinese that governments were forced to protect the ethnic interests of native Malays by adopting official preferential policies. Winners and losers in his online review of Chua's book, Matt Nuenki suggests that the best explanation for the ability of the Chinese to establish and maintain their position as a market-dominant minority throughout the region is the significant IQ gap in favor of the Chinese between them and the native populations. The IQ differential between Chinese and white Australians is not as large, but it does exist, and already it has had a striking effect on the competition for places in higher education and access to professional careers, with white Australians being the big losers. Prominent Chinese leaders, such as the former Prime Minister of Singapore, Li Kuan Yew, now boast openly that East Asians share with Jews a place at the top of the racial pyramid. In Australia, too, one Chinese writer has described the xenophobic, even downright racist attitudes long harbored by his people. That ingrained racial realism reinforces age-old tendencies toward ethnic nepotism among Asian peoples. If a British-style representative democracy had been grafted onto Singapore's multiracial society, Li Kuan Yew is sure that Malays would always vote for Muslims, Indians for Indians, and the Chinese for Chinese, even at the expense of other economic or social interests. Such ethnocentric attitudes have been powerfully reinforced in recent times by a communist government that, having lost its Marxist ideological mooring, is fearful of losing control over its vast empire. Immigrants from mainland China have been taught to hate the foreign devils and cherish the motherland, which never has done, and never could do, any wrong. Steeped from childhood in an ever more aggressive Chinese nationalism, such immigrants are unlikely to resist powerfully ingrained habits of ethnic nepotism. Indeed, even the British-American writer John Derbyshire, who has a Chinese wife, warns that mass Chinese immigration brings with it the very real danger of an imported Sino-fascism. That danger must become ever more pronounced as China itself advances in military and economic might. But even if we leave that geopolitical dimension of the problem aside, there is no denying that. Individualistic white Australians, taught from infancy that white racial pride is a grave moral failing and that ethnic nepotism is an unlawful form of racial discrimination, will be extraordinarily vulnerable to competition from a much more cohesive cognitive elite of overseas Chinese. 
Janet Lander points out that in overseas Chinese society, Confucian ethics prescribe differences in patterns of mutual aid obligations between people with varying degrees of social distance within a well-defined social structure, near kinsmen e.g., family members, distant kinsmen in extended family and lineage, clansmen, fellow villagers, and people speaking the same dialect. The strongest ties are within the family, where social distance is at a minimum. Trustworthiness in trade relations is generally measured in terms of concentric circles extending outward from family and near kin. On Lander's analysis, Chinese social structure, unlike Western social structure, which is individualistic in nature, consists of a careful ranking of people who are classified according to distinct categories of social relationships. Outside the framework of established relationships, the overseas Chinese are brutal competitors. Steep hierarchies and inequality are accepted as a normal part of life so that strangers cannot expect to be treated on a par with friends and family. Accordingly, Indonesian Chinese bankers experience no ethical difficulty in forwarding a stranger's loan application as strategically important information to members of their business networks doing business in the same area and industry as the loan applicant. Armed with that information, the banker's associates might not only move into the business but set out as well to implement the business plan submitted along with the stranger's loan application. The strongest ethical obligation among the overseas Chinese is to preserve social harmony, but strangers falling outside the circle of ethically significant others are fair game, their disappointment and anger cannot disrupt social harmony. Clearly, the greater in-group solidarity of Chinese operating within such a social structure will give them a powerful edge in competition with unorganized, individualistic white Australians. Even the nuclear family has lost much of its former power to bind white Australians together into cohesive units capable of meeting stiff competition from East Asian cognitive elites. Middle-class Australians face little competitive pressure from the low end of the market for third-world immigrants, but the downside for the nation as a whole is even more obvious. Tensions are already appearing between white Australians and the growing numbers of black, sub-Saharan Africans settled here by the transnational refugee industry. One can safely predict that, no matter how large this particular third world colony becomes, black Africans will never become a market-dominant minority in Australia. On the contrary, experience practically everywhere in the world tells us that an expanding black population is a surefire recipe for increases in crime, violence and a wide range of other social problems. Unfortunately, experience also demonstrates that any such suggestion will produce nothing short of a hysterical reaction among Australian journalists and academics. For Australian intellectual and cultural elites, it does not seem to matter that support for such observations can be found in countless academic and official sources. After all, it is hardly news that violent criminals of any race are likely to be people with low IQs who display poor impulse control. Nor is it difficult to establish that, on average, black sub-Saharan Africans score around 70 to 75 on IQ tests while white Europeans have a mean score of 100 and East Asians about 105. It is equally well known that young black men have higher levels of serum testosterone, often associated with impulsive behavior and poor judgment, than whites or East Asians. Now, this does not mean that black Africans carry a crime gene. Nor can one say that blacks are genetically more crime-prone than whites. But, as Michael Levin points out, it does make sense to say that blacks are more prone to behavior that is in fact criminalized in virtually all societies. Australians will ignore these racial realities at their peril. In the White Australia policy, Keith Winschuttle sees no cause for concern in the ethnic replacement of white, Christian Europeans by Chinese or Muslim newcomers. He has accepted mass third world immigration with equanimity, perhaps even with a sense of self-congratulation. Utterly confident that non-white migrants can be assimilated into the individualistic norms of Western culture, Winschuttle looks upon both racial prejudice and religious intolerance not as essential ingredients in collective identity but as embarrassing social diseases. Managerial multiculturalism like the managerial class generally, Winschuttle does not experience his membership in the Australian nation as if he belongs to a community of kin. Unlike the bourgeois pioneers of Anglo-American capitalism, managed real professional elites are no longer rooted in particular communities, they are, at best indifferent and actually hostile to, specific identities, derived from class, ethnicity and race, religion, region and gender. This requires the repudiation not just of ethnic nationalism but also of any civic nationalism grounded in pre-political loyalties of a territorial kind, loyalties rooted in a sense of the common home and of the transgenerational society that resides there. The flip side of the universalism and egalitarianism sponsored by the managerial regime is, therefore, the multicultural politics of identity. Doctrines of racial egalitarianism and official multiculturalism may appear to contradict one another but the social and political function of both is to undermine the white, Christian, masculine, and bourgeois values and institutions that remain the principal constraints on managerial reach and power.
Under the aegis of the globalist regime, the shared civic culture that is the greatest achievement of Anglo-American constitutionalism is being displaced by a neo-feudal system of group representation. Promoting this program, James Tully attacks modern Western constitutionalism because it threatens the extinction or assimilation of different cultures. Not only did modern constitutionalism authorize imperial rule of former colonies over indigenous peoples, it still underwrites cultural imperialism over the diverse citizens of contemporary societies. Tully's ideal of intercultural negotiation aims to replace the individualistic society of strangers with the politics of cultural recognition. Significantly, the only culture that cannot be accommodated within what Tully calls the convention of mutual recognition is the common civic culture of Anglo-American constitutionalism. Modernist universalism will be supplanted by postmodernist particularism. Faced with the reality of cultural diversity, the Anglo-American civic culture has been expansive in nature. In other words, it has been geared toward the assimilation of difference. Tully's multicultural constitutionalism, by contrast, is separatist or exclusive in that it is geared toward the magnification and encouragement of difference. These two very different constitutional cultures cannot coexist, a choice between them must be made. Anglo-American civic cultures developed a strong momentum towards political connectedness in order to overcome the separatist pull of diversity and disagreement. Building on long experience with non-kinship-based forms of reciprocity, the civic cultures of British-derived societies stimulated the development of imaginative empathy among citizens. Everyone was required to imagine himself in the position of a person whose starting point is radically different from his own. Multicultural constitutionalism, by contrast, is already causing our shared civic culture to fragment. The momentum towards separatism is growing. Managerial elites have an obvious interest in dividing subject populations, the better to dominate them. In line with that strategy, multicultural constitutionalism encourages the citizenry to divide itself into groups in order to win politically controlled benefits. Not surprisingly, once interest groups succeed in winning special benefits, the separatist pool grows stronger. Group representation spawns new elites with a vested interest in thickening the boundaries between citizens. One corollary of the perennial process of intercultural negotiation is that there can be no possibility of general agreement on public goods. Multicultural constitutionalism assumes that diversity can be acknowledged and empowered only through constant political battle pitting the races and genders against each other in a never-ending contest for recognition and public benefits. Tully maintains the pious hope that every group will be able to stand on an equal footing in the contest over recognition and the political rewards that flow from it. However, it has long been an axiom of corporatist interest intermediation that not all groups possess equal procedural status. Groups lacking functional relevance to the globalist system or which are actually dysfunctional will be shunted aside unless they possess some other resource that enables them to generate destabilizing conflict. The basic premise that interest groups are not all created equal is particularly true of racial and ethnic groups. Tully is careful to cite William McNeil to make the point that polyethnicity has been the rule rather than the exception in the life of all advanced civilizations. He does not dwell on McNeil's companion observation that ethnic intermingling has produced a complex ethnic hierarchy whenever it has occurred. Any constitutional order that sets out deliberately to grant special privileges to particular ethnic groups inevitably will produce a still more complex ethnic hierarchy. The relative standing of any given group probably will depend to a significant degree on its performance within the global system of needs. There can be no automatic right to consent or cultural continuity or even recognition of group rights within the context of that dynamic system. A group that is functionally relevant or possesses a significant conflict potential today may find itself in the dustbin of history tomorrow. While it may be difficult to predict permanent winners in the incessant competition for increasingly scarce resources in a multiracial Australia, we can be sure that the civic culture created and nurtured by generations of white Anglo-Australians will be the sure loser. As continued third world immigration provides further impetus to the multiracialist politics of identity, the individualistic society of strangers will be extraordinarily vulnerable to competition from other, tightly knit, racial groups. In retreat from the rising tide of colour, white Australians may be forced to reinvent themselves as a people comme les autres, shedding their customary civic universalism in favour of a less natural but more powerfully particularistic racial consciousness. Windshuttle would be among the first to deplore any such development, even as his deracinated model of civic patriotism becomes an ever more maladaptive threat to the survival of the historic Australian nation. Racial realists who read Windschuttle's book will discover ample evidence that, if his tender-minded attitudes prevail, white Australians are destined to be displaced by immigrant groups much less sensitive to charges of racism and xenophobia. One example, Windschuttle informs us that the most violent race riots in Australian history were led, not by murderous white racists, but by Japanese pearl divers determined to eliminate competition from Timorese rivals. <laughs> 
There were three such riots in Broome, Western Australia, in 1907, 1914, and 1920. The last continued for a week and involved more than half the town's population of 5,000. Seven people were killed and more than 60 seriously injured, dwarfing the casualty figures for the worst of the anti-Chinese goldfield riots of the mid-19th century. Almost every immigrant group encountered in Windschuttle's narrative, not to mention the Aboriginal population, displays a strong sense of racial solidarity and an aggressive determination to advance its particular ethnic genetic interests. Much the same can be said for the post-war governments in Japan and the Third World leading the diplomatic offensive against the White Australia policy. Throughout her book on the deconstruction of the White Australia policy, Gwenda Taven is, of course, sympathetic to the relentless attacks by non-white nations on Australia's immigration policies. She remains strangely uninterested in their simultaneous determination to retain tight control over their own borders. Unfortunately this is par for the academic course, educated white Australians, leftist idealists, and right-wing ratbags alike remain, at best, resolutely indifferent and, at worst, actively hostile to the survival of their own ethnonation. Indeed, immigration enthusiasts spend every effort to hasten the long, slow death of white Australia. The brazen treason of the intellectuals marching under the banner of managerial multiculturalism has transformed a successful society of sociable strangers into an alphabet soup of self-assertive and mutually indifferent aliens. Conclusion Given the relentless and revolutionary assault on their historic national identity, white Australians now face a life-or-death struggle to preserve their homeland. Whether effective resistance to their displacement and dispossession can be mounted is another question. Unlike other racial, ethnic, or religious groups well equipped to practice the politics of identity, white Australians lack a strong, cohesive sense of ethnic solidarity. As a consequence, ordinary Australians favouring a moratorium on non-white immigration cannot count on effective leadership or support from their co-ethnics among political, intellectual, and corporate elites. On the contrary, our still predominantly Anglo-Australian rulers are indifferent, some profit from, and others actually take pride in, their active collaboration with the Third World Colonisation of Australia. None of the major parties, indeed, not one member of the Commonwealth Parliament, offers citizens the option of voting to defend and nurture Australia's Anglo-European identity. The problem, in short, is clear, the Australian nation is bereft of a responsible ruling class. The solution is, in principle, no less obvious, namely, the restoration of a ruling class rooted in the reinvigorated folkways of an authentically Anglo-American civic patriotism, a ruling class reattached. 